Hello, everybody. Welcome into the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. I'm Ryan Warnley, joined today by Andrew Erickson and Pat Fitzmorris. This is our Tight Ends Rankings and Tiers episode. We just taped the Quarterbacks episode, so if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to go find that video as well and check out the Top 32 Quarterback Rankings and Tiers. We'll be talking about the Top 25 Rankings and Tiers on this part of the episode. Just a reminder for everybody, all of our early 2024 Consensus Rankings and Tiers can be found at fantasypros.com slash rankings. Rankings. Let's dive right in, guys. Tier one, four names deep. It's Sam Laporta, Travis Kelsey, Trey McBride, and Mark Andrews. Fitz, I asked you this question on the quarterback side. It was also four names. It also was maybe like a little chalky. Are these like kind of the consensus correct four names here for tight end as well? I do think everyone in tier one belongs in tier one. I would actually be tempted to include Dalton Kincaid in this group also Um, had a really nice stretch last season when Dawson Knox missed five games and Kincaid's snap share went up. Kincaid had 31 catches and 281 yards during those five games, which works out to 105 catch pace, a 955 yard pace. And then Kincaid also got a usage bump at the end of the season. Uh, The bills last two regular season games when they were playing for their playoff lives and their two playoff games, Over that four-game stretch, Kincaid had 19 catches for 275 yards, which works out to better than a 1,000-yard pass. And now the Bills have no Stephon Diggs. Like, they need Kincaid to play a prominent role as a pass catcher, and I kind of think he's going to. And by the way, Worm, just a a general word about tight end. Like, in past years, I used to really not look forward to the tight end shows here. And I don't know, it seemed like every year we would talk ourselves into uh, the possibility that there actually was tight end depth. This year, I think we really have it with some of the young tight ends who've emerged in recent years. Uh, You know, Laporta last year, Kincaid, Trey McBride with a nice second year breakout. Um, Like, hope that Kyle Pitts comes back now that he doesn't have Arthur Smith's play calling to overcome. I'm excited about the tight end position this year for a change. It's it's kind of refreshing. So what you're saying is you haven't learned your lesson over the years of getting excited about tight end. <laughs> I'm ready to get my heart yes, broken again. Yes, we are going again. back exactly. to that well. You're ready to – it's the Michael Scott, uh, no doubt about it. I am ready to get hurt again. Um, yeah, I – I hope you're right. It would sure be nice to have, you know, fun tight ends to uh, be excited about and have them actually pan out for the first time, uh, basically in my fantasy playing career. Um, <laughs> do you think that Kincaid, you, like you would have him ahead of anybody in tier one or you just think he's five, but he should be in the tier? No, I've got him tight end three. Tight end three. Okay. Behind Laporta and Kelsey. Erickson, what do you think about that adding Kincaid into this tier? That's the only thing I had complaining about tier one was I, I was like, why isn't Dalton Kincaid in this discussion? <laughs> I mean, he checks off the boxes of, okay, he's got round one draft capital, check. He's got talent, check. He's got a good quarterback, check. And he's got a path to targets, check. Like, that's what you're looking for in an elite tight end when it comes to the peripherals. And he has all those things. So I don't see why he can't, again, any, any of these tight ends that we're talking about in this top tier, I don't think no one would bat an eye and say, oh, like that, Dalton Kincaid finishes a tight end one overall. Like, I would not be surprised at that. And, and that's why with this tier in particular, I just like getting the guy who goes drafted last in which this case always tends to be Dalton Kincaid. Um, and the other one I really like is, is Mark Andrews. Look, I look Mark Andrews before he was hurt. He was tight end three overall averaging 12.2 points per game. And that was the number one mark among tight ends last year. And now he's tight end four in ADP. So I think it's just a little bit of, Oh, we haven't seen Mark Andrews. We didn't see him at the end of the season. We saw him come back and basically not really be hundred percent healthy. That last game, the Ravens played, he was active. So if anything, that just tells you he's healthy. Like he's not like rehabbing his injury anymore. Like he's good to go. So I like buying the discount on Mark Andrews. who I actually have as my tight end one. That, you know, Andrew's really tough for me because he's obviously outside of Kelsey. He's older than these other guys we're talking about. But he has, you know, a longer track record, like because he's older and the Ravens didn't add a receiver this offseason outside of Devontae Walker, who was a fourth round pick and is going to be somewhat limited, particularly as a rookie. That is really good for Andrews. I mean, you look at the receiving core. It's Rashad Bateman, who's never quite put it all together. It's Zay Flowers, who's not the biggest guy. It's Tez Walker, who's a day three rookie. Andrews is going to be the guy in the red zone. He like, And he always has been in his career. That is not changing this year, uh, even with sort of the emergence of Isaiah Likely. I think Andrews is going to be the best you know pass catcher in this offense. Uh, so I, 
I think he's getting a little undervalued because he's not this shiny new breakout from last year like Laporta and McBride and the excitement around Kincaid. Um, but but I, I don't know that I would put him one. I think what Sam Laporta did was impressive enough that I would probably just have him there and, and not try to overthink it. Um, to me, what's really interesting is that uh, of the Fantasy Pro staff, you 2 Debro, and Joey P., Every one of you has a different tight end number one. Debra has Trey McBride number one. Erickson is Mark Andrews number one. Fitz is Sam Laporta number one. And Joe has Travis Kelsey number one. So, you know, while, while Laporta is number one in technically the industry, you know, expert consensus rankings, there's not really a consensus here, uh, you know, amongst amongst the Fantasy Pros staff. Fitz, just because I don't want to, you know, move, you know, move past this here without talking about them. Uh, Laporta and Kelsey, just what do you make of those two quickly? Because you have them one and two. Yeah, and it's really close. I mean, I I could make a case for Kelsey being number one. It's just that Laporta came into the league and was so impressive right off the bat, and he did it with a target hog at wide receiver there, Amon Ra St. Brown. So, like, his ability to earn targets and uh, be, you know, really productive right from the get-go with a high-volume receiver there, um, no reason to think he can't do it again, and the, the Lions really haven't added any significant firepower at wide receiver, so... Let's get into. Yeah, I I think he can. I think he can have a suitable encore to that impressive rookie year performance. Let's get into tier two here. We already mentioned Kincaid is at the top. Uh, he's tight end five. Six is George Kittle. Seven is Kyle Pitts. Eight is Evan Ingram, and nine is David Njoku. Erickson, who stands out here? I like uh, Evan Ingram and David Njoku. Um, I, I think I think I like them more than Kyle Pitts because. Look, Kyle Pitts right now, we're projecting to be better, right? He's going to be an offense that's going to throw the ball more. He's going to finally break out. It's finally going to happen for him when guys like Evan Ingram and David Njoku, didn't they already do what we're hoping Pitts can do? Like, like what has Evan Ingram done since he landed in Jacksonville? It's like, oh, like, we shouldn't be excited about this guy. He only caught 114 balls last year. <laughs> <laughs> like, why? Do, what else did we see from Evan Ingram? He was a first-round pick, too. Both these guys are first-round picks, Evan Ingram and David Njoku. Like, yes, they weren't picked as high as Kyle Pitts, but they've already broken out like in their offenses so like why are we questioning oh we've got to put pits ahead of them so that's my one kind of reservation i think evan ingram is like a super steal where he's going in drafts like i know they added obviously they got rid of calvin Ridley, but adding brian thomas adding gabe davis but those types of targets aren't really taking away from over the middle like with evan ingram like that's where evan ingram and christian kirk are going to you know operate in this jacksonville offense that i think can throw the ball a ton so yeah, I think that those guys are valuable. We saw what David Joke was able to do at the end of last year, basically operate as a top five tight end, an absolute uh, heater with Joe Flacco at quarterback. I think that he's still the, I think, number two receiver on the Browns behind only Mari Cooper. So, yeah, I think that those guys are values. And, and when it comes to George Kittle, it's just a matter of, like, what kind of ride do you want to be on? Like, <laughs> like he's not going to be consistent in any way, shape, or form because there are times when, I mean, what, last year he had three catches and three touchdowns in the same game. <laughs> like, like that kind of stuff is a George Kill stat line where he has games where he's going to totally disappear and give you zero. But he also has games where he can actually win your week for you, which is pretty rare at tight end, especially given how touchdown dependent it usually is. So George Kittle, I think, is totally fine to be in this tier two. And just a matter of like your tolerance and how you want to operate the tight end role. Like if you think that you just want to chase the upside on a week to week basis with Kittle and just take your lumps, I think that then you should draft George Kittle. But if you would rather have a guy that's a little bit more consistent a week-to-week basis where you're not feeling like he's going to give me zero or give me like 25, then I think that you prefer someone like an Evan Ingram or David Njoku, I think project to be more consistent on a week-to-week basis, just based on the target share that is in their respective offenses. Yeah. Speaking of, you know, no doubt about it, I'm ready to get hurt again. Like Fitz, are we going back to Kyle Fitz once more? (laughs) Because everybody who's had him the last couple of years has been burned pretty badly. Uh, And yet I find myself looking at him and saying i might like to uh to jump on that train again what do you think i am on board which is going to no doubt infuriate some of the people watching it watching or listening to this because like it, it's amazing how much anger there is if you tout kyle pitts now just so many people have gotten burned by him but um there are plausible explanations why he has uh failed to fire the last couple of years one obviously the play calling of arthur smith i think was a big thing last year um and then like we don't know how healthy he's been because he had that mcl sprain and then we later found out uh that like there was pcl damage too 
So he maybe wasn't at 100% last year, and, and hopefully he will be this year. Let's not forget, this was the first tight end in 60 years to have a 1,000-yard season as a rookie. Like, Pitts was the first guy to do that since Mike Ditka. Um, like, he is... Uh, was a really great prospect coming into the league. And I still think he's that guy. Hopefully, um, now that some of the obstacles have been cleared from his path, we'll see more of that this year. And uh, by the way, I love Erickson's point on Engram. Like, I I think people still view him as the uh, drop-prone, injury-prone guy that he was on the Giants. But, like, he is uh, Trevor Lawrence's binky. Basically, like he is a short area guy averaged under 10 yards per catch. Like he's the designated short area receiver in this offense. I think he's going to catch a ton of balls. They lost Ridley and the two guys they've added, Brian Thomas and Gabe Davis, are both like vertical threats. But Pitts is going to own those short and intermediate targets again. I think when talking about Kyle Pitts, too, it's important to remember, like, he's going to start this season at 23 years old. It's because he yes. came into the league so young, it's easy to think of him as older. Younger Ty- than Bo Nix. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle Pitts, uh, you know, <laughs> a, a, he's young, and tight end is a position that typically, you know, that's why I was so impressed with what Laporta did, because he did it right away. Typically, it takes a couple years for tight ends to really, you know, break out in the NFL. He's still so young. And I really love the point about his 1,000-yard season as a rookie because I think a lot of times people who are kind of tired of Pitts and and tired of hearing about him are like, well, listen, just because he was a good prospect doesn't mean – like he's never done it in the NFL. He has done it in the NFL. He didn't have the touchdowns, you know, to go with it. Um, but he has had a thousand yard season as a rookie. Like that to me, that is like that carries just as much weight as his crazy prospect pred- pedigree in the draft. Um, the other thing with the Falcons is like theoretically, you know, assuming health or, or whatever, this should be the best quarterback position, you know, situation that he's played with. Um, obviously, we're all excited to see Arthur Smith gone. Um, and also this, the fact that they didn't, uh, you know, draft Aroma Dunze or whoever they could have taken at eight if they had gone in that direction and not taken Michael Penix. It means it's still a pretty clear target tree in this offense. It's going to be, you know, Bijan getting the heavy workload on the ground and possibly some of the passing game. And then Drake London and Kyle Pitts. Like, there's not another mouth to feed in the offense. So, like, again, I, I like I, I want to almost couch everything I'm saying with, I get it. I know it's Kyle Pitts. But if you can look past the emotional scarring that, you know, previous Kyle Pitts managers have had, and, you know, I've, I've had some pretty lucrative memes on the Fantasy Bros account making fun of Kyle Pitts and managers who keep going back to that well. Uh, I think there's a real case for upside here. And, in fact, when I'm looking at this tier, if you set aside Kincaid, I think he's the name that is most likely to be a tier one guy a year from now if you if you made me pick from this group. Um, so I, I'm, I'm willing to buy into that upside. The other one thing I want to quickly say on this tier is I would be wary of David Njoku. I know people have liked him in the past. Joe Flacco adores throwing to tight ends. I would be really wary of putting too much stock uh, into his finish last year when Flacco was playing quarterback because Flacco, like, it doesn't matter the offense he's in. He will pepper his tight end. And and Njoku's a good player. I'm just not sure if we're going to see the same thing out of uh, out of Deshaun Watson and, and this year's offense that we saw to end last year with Njoku. So he, he is probably my least favorite in this tier. Fitz, what do you quickly think about Njoku? Yeah, to your point, Njoku scored four of his six touchdowns in the six games Joe Flacco played last year. So I do think that's a concern that Njoku has not shown the same chemistry with Deshaun Watson that he has with Joe Flacco. Let's go to tier three here. Uh, it runs from tight end 10 to tight end 16. The names are Jake Ferguson, Dallas Goddard, Brock Bowers, TJ Hawkinson, Dalton Schultz, Cole Komet, and Pat Fryermuth. Fitz, uh, let's start right at the top because I've heard you talk about Jake Ferguson on a few other shows, so I'm sure he's somebody you want to talk about here. Yes, sir. I think the top three tight ends in this tier, Ferguson, Goddard, Bowers, all have tier two upside. And... Ferguson, I I like for a lot of the same reasons I like Dak Prescott. I think the Cowboys could be really pass-heavy this year. Um, Beyond C.D. Lamb, they don't have a lot of firepower at wide receiver. I mean, Brandon Cooks kind of fell off a bit last year and didn't really really command targets at the level we're used to seeing Brandon Cooks command targets at. Uh, Jalen Tolbert, I mean, who knows if he's going to pan out. So, like, I wouldn't be surprised if Ferguson equaled or bettered his numbers from a 2023 season that I think everyone considered a really pleasant surprise. So yeah, I I like him a lot. And I I think you can almost make a case for him being an end of tier two 
tight end. Erickson, what do you think about Ferguson? Um, I think that Ferguson is ranked correctly, like based on what he did last year, based on his projection. But this middle tier of tight ends, to me, is the place I don't want to invest in tight end. Because, like, historically speaking, when you look at these middle range tight ends, you know, they are usually going in this range because of what they did last year, right? You know, Jake Ferguson benefited from a lot of touchdowns last year. He was, I believe, the second, he was top three in terms of, like, red zone targets because the Dallas Cowboys... Like we all saw with Tony Pollard, could not score any rushing touchdowns. All they did was throw the ball in the red zone. Jake Ferguson benefited from that. C.D. Lamb benefited from that. So for me, I I think that I'm not excited about really any of these guys. I, I really, I when you sent over the show sheet, I, this was my DND tier. Do not draft here. Like I don't want to draft guys from this tier because I think that there are holes with a lot of these players where, at least in tier two, I feel stronger about the ceiling outcomes for those players. For these, I'm I'm just not I'm not impressed. Like Dallas Goddard needs a guy to get hurt on the Eagles. Like AJ Brown, Devontae Smith, like he's not an alpha on that offense. Like Brock Bowers, I've talked about. I do not like the situation. Dalton Schultz, what, what, is he going to get? Any, what is he like? The fifth look on the Houston Texans? Cole Komet, what about him? Like loaded with receivers. Pat Fryermuth. Question marks about the Steelers offense. For me, it's less about like the upside case with these players and more about the downside case. And I think that this tier is much longer and goes into like tier four where I'll just wait. Like if I've waited up to this point at tight end, I feel like the guys going later than this tier, I can just get similar production or maybe just a little bit less of production. And at that point, I'm just going to wait longer. So I'm not really enthralled with any of these specific tight ends. The one guy I do like is actually TJ Hawkinson, but he's only going in this tier because he's injured. But my bet would be when he comes back, okay, now I have a guy that can actually put up elite numbers because we've seen him do that. Now, again, with the injury, we don't really know. We don't know when he's going to come back. But I do know at least, hey, I can start this guy. Potentially, he can actually be a difference maker where everyone else in this tier to me is kind of like replaceable production. Like, I'm not afraid of any of these guys. And if I see Dalton Schultz in my opponent's lineup, I'm not I'm not scared. <laughs> I'm not like, oh no, like here he comes, like Jake Ferguson, Dallas Goddard. Like, I'm not afraid of these guys and I don't feel like I need to get them. So I would rather just wait than kind of reach here in tier three where this is the middle range of tight ends where I just don't like to draft. Do you really think Hawkinson can put up elite numbers? I mean, he's coming off a torn ACL and MCL and that injury happened on Christmas Eve day. So he's going to be on pop. And after he gets back, I mean, you wonder if he's going to be totally right physically. He's sharing targets with Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison, and those targets are probably going to be coming from a rookie quarterback. I, I, look, I don't know the answer to that, but I know that it's also baked into his price. Like, that that's really the play with Hawkinson, because again, like I said, like, I don't view any of these tight ends really as difference makers, where if Hawkinson, he does come back healthy, you know, what if McCarthy plays above average for a rookie quarterback? What if Jefferson or Jordan Addison gets hurt? What if he's not coming back to the, be the number three? Like, there's just a lot of question marks, and it's like, if I miss out on Dallas Goddard or Jake Ferguson at the shot at TJ Hawkinson in the back half of the season, when my I really need a tight end boost. Like I have a guy who is at least produced as a top elite option, which many of these other guys really haven't outside potentially one year. I'm willing to take that risk. So Fitz, I mean, you, you talked about at the top of this show, how much, you know, you, you think it's a really exciting year for the position and there's more depth than we've typically had. In looking through the tiers, I actually I don't I don't totally disagree because I kind of like the tier two maybe more than I have in previous years. But I'm pretty confident I want to be coming away with one of the first eight ish tight ends off the board because I think Erickson does lay out a pretty good case for there's just like it, it's kind of uninspiring when you get into tier three and there are kind of red flags for all of these guys and I would much prefer to have one of the tier one guys obviously or tier two guys. You know, I, to me, there's a pretty clear gap between tier two and tier three. Maybe you could make the case for like Ferguson to be, you know, higher up or whatever, like one or two of these guys. But most of them, I feel like, you know, I'm pr I'm pretty uh, confident or pretty unconfident in. I don't think I don't even know that's the word, but uh, I'm not too thrilled uh, with these situations for all of these guys. Um, but I guess do you, is is this tier three kind of what you were thinking about when you were talking about being more depth? Yeah. So I mean, like. I'll give you a, a concrete example. I've done some best ball drafts where I have seized on the opportunity to get one of the sure thing running backs in the early rounds, like the guys who are like B. John Robinson, Brees Hall, Jonathan Taylor. And so subsequently, I felt obligated to try to play catch up at wide receiver in the, the next few rounds. And that sort of uh, took me away from the opportunity to get one of those tier one or two, tier two tight ends. 
So I did my tight end shopping a little later and came away with Jake Ferguson or like some combination of of Dallas Goddard and Pat Fryermuth. And I was OK with it. Like, I mean, I could see upside for Pat Fryermuth, actually, with not a lot of wide receiver firepower on the Steelers. And they should have better quarterbacking this year with the combination of Russell Wilson and Justin Fields. And I know that we do have to contend with Arthur Smith, who, um, you know, we like Kyle Pitts last year and there were games where John U. Smith had more targets. So um, I'm not going to say that isn't concerning, but like, I don't know. I, I do think there is a path for Pat Fryermuth to maybe be a top 10 tight end this year. So I don't totally hate the idea of maybe like getting two guys from tier three and uh, playing matchups and hoping like one of these guys has a uh, an unexpectedly good year. So um, I, I don't know. I guess I like tier three more than you guys do. I want to ask before I move off the tier fits. I mean, if uh, if Kyle Pitts isn't the best tight end prospect to come out in recent memory, it's because Brock Bowers is. And we have him, you know, in the expert consensus rankings as – a top 12 tight end here right off the bat, despite the uh, uninspiring landing spot. Uh, to me, when I look at Bowers, uh, we've spoken you know, on the Dynasty show about how I'm not moving him out of the top eight in in my Dynasty rookie rankings just because he went to, to Vegas. Um, for redraft, though, in year one, it is obviously a concern. They have Michael Mayer. Obviously, Devontae Adams is going to get a lot of targets. Jacoby Myers is there. It's a, not a good quarterback situation. All those things. Having said all that, he is such a good prospect and was good from basically the day he stepped onto the field of Georgia. Like, it's hard for me to imagine him not being good uh, the day he steps onto the field in the NFL. He's just that kind of special, uh, you know, of a, of a prospect. And I think there's a path that he's just the Raiders slot receiver this year. And they let Michael Mayer do kind of the dirty work. And, you know, maybe Mayer steals some of the touchdowns. And again, obviously, there's other mouths to feed in the offense. But, but I feel like there's a path where he's just like – the second most targeted guy in this offense. It's not a guarantee, but that's somewhat appealing at a position like tight end. What do you think about that? I agree with you. And I don't know what, uh, how much else I can say on top of that, but yeah, like we could look back and feel silly for fading Brock Bowers in his rookie year. Like he might just be that good. I, I will say that if you maybe do take that chance on him, that you maybe do want to take a second tight end and I know like there are a lot of leagues where that's not really, um, I don't know, maybe leagues where there are only 14 rounds in the draft and you've got limited roster spots. And it's kind of hard to tr- take a second tight end if, if you've got a 14 round draft. But that might be one instance where you do kind of want to, uh, I don't know, hedge your bets a little with someone else. Erickson, I know that you were as against the landing spot as anybody, but quickly, what do you make of Bowers in, uh, in terms of redrafts where he should be ranked? Well, I, I have him as tight end 10 because I think that the prospect offers a certain allure and upside that I think at that price, okay, I'm willing to take a shot on, on the talent. But this is the other thing that has me concerned about tier three, where it's not like the cheapest of the cheap tight ends, where you feel like you can just cut and, and move on. Like if you draft Brock Bowers, you're going to hold on to him. And that can be concerning because what if he's not firing to start the year? And you're missing out on tight ends that are breaking out all over the place that are late round guys, but you're stuck with Bowers because you drafted him. He's a rookie tight end. He's really talented. And yet he's just being sunk in the Raiders offense, but you're holding on to him. Like that's my concern with tier three is like, it's a little bit more of an investment than this next tier we're going to talk about. And I'm afraid that's going to make me feel kind of like that, uh, low sunk cost fallacy, right? Where you've already put into it some investment. You don't want to move on from it right away, but you're missing opportunities for better investments with some of these later guys, which is why I want to wait longer. Cause it's like week one, they don't fire gone. Like I'm cutting this guy right away. Brock Bowers. If he doesn't fire in week one, are you going to cut him? Probably not because he's a first round pick and he's exciting and he's a rookie. And that could be to your detriment in the end of it. When you miss out on tight ends that break out in week one, that have unexpected roles. What about the Vikings? I mentioned TJ Hawkinson. What if Robert Tanyan has like this massive game in week one? <laughs> if he, cause he's the starting tight end for the Vikings, right? What are you going to, are you going to cut Brock Bowers, pick up Robert Tanyan? Like, like those are, we're going to be talking about this in the week one waiver wire. I know it. It's going to happen. So how do I stop that? I just don't draft anybody from this tight end tier in the first place. Let's get to that, that last tier here, tier four. It's tight end 17 <laughs> through 25. Uh, Luke Musgrave, Hunter Henry, Juwan Johnson, Cade Otten, Chiga Conquo, Tucker Craft, Isaiah Likely, Tyler Conklin, and Ben Sinnott. Um, the tier actually goes further, but we're just doing the top 25 guys here. Um, 
So Fitz, you know, of those names, you know, kind of like I was talking about with three, like even more so, like there's just not a lot of names that I really, I really like here. Like I like Kraft, but Musgrave is there. I like Likely, but Andrews is there. Um, you know, I know that Debra is really high on Ben Sinnott. You know, are any of these names sticking out to you as, you know, if you miss out on the kind of the top crop at the position that you're happy to have these guys as fallback options? In certain leagues, and those leagues are the ones that are deep, the ones where you're drafting like 20 rounds, 22 rounds, I like taking Isaiah Likely just because whenever Mark Andrews is hurt, Isaiah Likely is like a mid-range tight end one. So I like that upside. The the only thing is, if Mark Andrews is playing, like Isaiah Likely has no value. Um, And the Packers' tight ends are interesting. Um, It's hard to tell how... Green Bay is going to divide the the playing time between Luke Musgrave and Tucker Craft. For the first 10 games of the 2023 season, it was Musgrave as the primary tight end and, and Kraft as the backup just sort of mixing in. Then Musgrave lacerated his kidney and missed six games, and Kraft played pretty well while Musgrave was out. Then Musgrave comes back in Week 18, plays only nine snaps, and in the playoffs, Kraft kind of ran ahead of Musgrave. So... I, I still think Musgrave is number one on the depth chart, but I'm not sure about that. And it's possible the Packers play enough 11 personnel this year where like both of these guys could be somewhat impactful. But um, I don't know. I mean, it's just same issue with the Packers is they have so many viable pass catchers that it's hard for any one guy to pop in that offense. If I'm drafting one of these guys, Kraft and Likely are the the two that I'm most interested in. I actually think likely, you know, I think I might have been too harsh on him when I first introed this tier because the the fact that they didn't add a receiver, and we I already talked about this with Andrews, and you know, Lamar is cutting weight and talking about kind of getting back to some of that speed he had in 2019. They ran a lot of two tight end and even three tight end sets in that 2019 season. And I don't think that the offense is going to look like that again. But I wouldn't be surprised given the kind of second half breakout we saw from likely at last year when Andrews was hurt. And the fact that really like out about beyond Zay Flowers, there's no proven commodity in this receiving core. It would not shock me if likely was a viable, you know, maybe like a high end tight end two. Uh, even when Andrews is healthy. And you're right. I mean, I think he's a tier two guy in any game that Andrews isn't playing. Like, I I would be really that confident in him there. I think he might have some playability even when Andrews is healthy. I want to see how it pans out, but he's one of the guys that I think could have some upside here. Erickson, which name stands out to you in tier four? So I love Tucker Craft. Like he's the guy that I, I basically drafted every single best ball draft as my like second or third tight end. Cause I, I just think that he's way better than Luke Musgrave. And I think that when Musgrave, again, he was healthy last year, they drafted him first. Okay. He can be the starter. He was, he wasn't great. And then he got hurt and must or uh, Tucker craft was better. I, I thought Tucker, Tucker craft was a better prospect. So again, similar how you guys are buying into Brock Bowers as the confidence in the prospect profile and what he did at the college level. Like, I just think Tucker Craft is better than Luke Musgrave. And I think the coaches are going to see that too. And I think that week one comes around, Tucker Craft's going to be tight end one for the Green Bay Packers. And that's what I want to make sure I have at least him him on my bench because he's going to be someone that we're talking about. Hey, he's going to be the tight end one in this offense, not Luke Musgrave. So I love Tucker Craft a lot as my my favorite late round quarterbacks. The other guy, Hunter Henry. Look, he's playing in the, you know, we talked about David Njoku in that Alex Van Pelt offense. That offense is now in New England where it's going to be very tight end centric because you have a bunch of hodgepodge wide receivers that we're all trying to like see, is it Polk? Is it Baker? Like, is it Demario Douglas? Like who's going to step up? Hunter Henry is probably the most Purdueven pass catcher out of all of those guys. And he's a veteran. He signed, he re-signed with the Patriots as a free agent this off season. They have a plan for him. And he's also the number one, by far the number one red zone target. So if it's Jacoby Brissett, if it's Drake May, we saw Hunter Henry be productive with a rookie Mac Jones quarterback like his first year with the Patriots. So I, I think Hunter Henry is, again, looking for value. I don't think Hunter Henry is going to put up very very different numbers than a lot of guys in Tier 3, but you can get him at such a cheaper price than those players. So I like Hunter Henry. And then Tyler Conklin is like the the warm body. Like I looked at his numbers the last three years. He has 87 <laughs> targets for three straight seasons, exactly 87. So like if you just want to lock in 60 catches, 600 yards, that's been Tyler Conklin's stat line the last three seasons. It's just a matter of touchdowns. And considering he caught zero last year in the Jets offense that could not score any type of touchdowns, hey, if he becomes Aaron Rodgers' go-to guy, catches five or six touchdowns, like 
you're fine with that from just like, hey, I need a plug in. I need a warm body at tight end. Tyler Conklin is a guy that's going to put up some type of numbers, if, especially if he gets on the positive side of that touchdown variance. Any other final thoughts on the position fits? No, that's about it. Um, Juwan Johnson could be kind of interesting, by the way, in that last year, just because what else do the, the Saints have at wide receiver besides Chris Olave? Then it's like Rashid Shahid and uh, not much after that. Like, I wonder if he, although it just seems like he always has this limited um, role in that offense, I wonder if there's any chance of that expanding. And I will, uh, just to, I don't know, piggyback on Erickson's point about the Packer tight ends and why he likes Tucker Craft. I will say, like, the point at which Luke Musgrave got hurt last year was the point where Jordan Love went from being just okay to, like, going nuclear the rest of the season. And Tucker Craft, I think, kind of benefited from that more than Musgrave did when Jordan Love was just kind of hanging in there. I know you're ready to attribute. Or it was Kraft the... that did it all. <laughs> <laughs> Jordan Love's really not that good. It was just Tucker Kraft <laughs> elevating him to that extent. Um, yeah, but for the position as a whole, like I, I actually am excited about the tight end position this year, and I think there are a lot more different ways to play it. And the debate used to be, do we take Travis Kelsey in the first round or not? Because like you felt obligated to reach because there were only so many guys you felt good about starting a tight end in any given week. Well, now clearly no tight end is worthy of first round consideration just because there's other options. Like there are a variety of palatable options at tight end where in past years there have not been. So, um, you know, that's why I think the the third and fourth round is where you're going to see the elite tight ends going this year. Fitz, before we go, I do need to know, are, are we in on Jelani Woods? Is it happening? Uh, no. <laughs> no, like I just, Colts tight ends are where fantasy hopes go to die, man. I, I do not want to wade into that quagmire. What about you? Are you in on him? It's either him or Greg Dulcich. It's another another guy that like missed the entire season that you're like, dude, remember he flashed? Like, so some of these late round best balls, I'm I'm <laughs> the, swimming those for guys are Woods. Both, those guys are both tier five, by the way. Woods is tight end 34 and Dulcich is tight end 38 in hey, ACR. Well, tight ends we see every year. We see these guys like drastically beat their ADPs. So Robert Tunyon, yeah. you know, keep an eye on him. All right, we'll get out of there on that. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Hopefully you checked out the quarterback episode as well if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, but appreciate everybody sticking around for the rankings and tiers. For Erickson and Fitz, I'm Ryan Warmly. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.